So uh, I'm Nicole McClam. I presented in Take Root, which uh, in January of this year, so right before the end of the world as we knew it. Hi, I'm G.R. Gottlieb, uh, the director of Project 44. I also presented uh, recently in February uh, in Take Root, but I've also been a part of Green Space Blooms and other programming that the organization presents many years um, that I've been working with Green Space. And so super happy to have this platform to talk with Nicole today. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> So how are you doing, Nicole? I'm doing well. Like physically, I'm doing well. Um, emotionally, it's a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, I'm not feeling as creative as I would like to be. Mm -hmm. And I'll take that back. I'm incredibly creative domestically, you know, like how to make a meal that my child will eat out of a can of garbanzo beans and whatever's left over in terms of vegetables or how to play around with my budget to make sure that my paycheck lasts until the next <laughs> paycheck arrives. So that doesn't leave me with a lot of creative juice to make a dance, which I know I'll see on Facebook, a lot of friends will post these beautiful improvisations and I think, oh, that's, I'm not, I'm not there right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. You know, when the quarantine first started, I was like in the bed, like I can't move. I don't know what's happening. I'm not used to this. You know, I miss dancing. I miss going to my show. I miss doing all of these things. You know, and I had a lot of um, a lot of work lined up for myself and for Project 44. And unfortunately, uh, and, and, and no fault to the presenters that uh, things had to change. So it, it put me in a little like rut of not wanting to move, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when you did move, you saw, like you said, so many of our colleagues are like right on top of um, doing the online thing. And so it was a bit overwhelming. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, a friend of mine and I joked that this was the year of Nicole, because I, same thing as you, I had, I had all this, um, a friend of mine had acquired like a teaching and performance residency in Japan, so I was going to go to Japan. Um, wow. Yeah, that did not happen. <laughs> and, and then I'd also paid for my own vacation with my daughter, we'd saved up for it as opposed to my parents happened to be going on vacation and I tagged along and then they fed me. So <laughs> I, I felt like this real adult in that I was able to pay for a vacation. And yeah, I, I will say I successfully avoided teaching online and mm -hmm. through Instagram and Facebook, primarily because I, I didn't it wasn't that I didn't want to, it was that I, I learned through this process how, how much I need my home as a private space to recharge. And the, the thought even of having students in my home virtually for the rest of the semester, I, I'm like sweating bullets and like, oh my God, <laughs> people are going to be in my house and, you know, I'd have to like, curate the space and then eventually I, I rearranged my entire apartment to, to this configuration that you kind of see just to sort of like and this is what they will see of my apartment the window yeah. it. this is my office yes <laughs> no I totally understand yeah yeah so t tell me a little bit about your work my work that's a hard question um, I know I'm, I know <laughs> and, and thank you for that I'm I will say I am still learning about my work. Um, as an undergrad, I quickly learned that if I wanted to get that A, I will choreograph what my teacher wanted to see. So I mm. never really learned about my choreographic voice. And then in this like decade plus period between undergrad and grad school, I actually did everything I could to avoid 
choreographing. I, you know, um, there were several people who said, there's this, there's this weird sequence where dancers turn 30 and decide they need to start their own company and choreograph. If you're not doing that, if you don't want to do that, don't do that. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the times that I did choreograph, it's not that I was, I never did it. I always did it in service of someone else's choreographic vision. Mm. And uh, so when I did start to choreograph in graduate school, because I was required to, <laughs> Uh, again, I started to run into that. The, the teacher didn't like my work. Um, she's, she's like super, super postmodern. And I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So I'm still trying to like dismantle ballet inside my body and figure out like, what is it? What is it I want to choreograph about? Like, what do I have to say? And it wasn't until my graduate thesis, which I posted a little bit up on, um, or you might see, where I was actually talking about like just the process of understanding me. And so I think a lot of my work now is me trying to figure out like, why, why am I this way? Or what is this? Or more to the point, me sharing with my daughter, she's always my intended audience for these things mm -hmm. of like, you know, racism sucks. And I'm about to show you why in a 20 minute piece. <laughs> about right, my hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned um, ideally or having this thought about how to choreograph and what makes good choreography and things like that. You know, before I started, before I went to grad school, I went to undergrad for biology. So I was a scientist. Oh, chemistry. Yes, yeah. scientists. And so, you know, I was amazing at labs because we knew, follow these steps and you should get this result. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Or, or, or uh, dissecting or classifying things. These steps will lead to this. And mm -hmm. going to grad school, that's how I approached choreography. You know, and I, uh... and it didn't really work. And then I started to, okay, let me, I see people doing things in class and our comp teachers liking that. Let me do what they're doing. And she mm -hmm. still didn't like it. <laughs> I was so, I was so confused about what is, what are we doing? Um, and then one day, you know, we had to create solos during um, our, our first year at grad school. And she, pretty much micromanaged everything from music choice. We, sh we showed her every step along the way. And I didn't understand that she was trying to tear down layers or things that we had already kind of built um, that I think were a hindrance. Cause we, you know, I'm, I can give you a kickball change on the eight count real fast, you know? Yes. And I think she noticed that and she was challenging me to like get rid of that. Cause I remember her saying, she was like, she used to call me Jerry, even though she knew my name, love her to death though. She was like, Jerry, are you just gonna ooze on yourself today? <laughs> you know, meaning get on there and just, and do what I do with the eight count. And um, <laughs> it wasn't until after her saying many times no, that I was like, okay, let me do something different. And so I basically like wrote my own poem and recited that to this, <clears throat> to a struggle of moving. And then mm. I ended up flipping everyone off at the very end. And she loved it. Oh my <laughs> goodness. And, and that really sparked a journey for me to, um, to just create work or my intention to create work is to have people feel something. And that can be, um, oh, oh, and it's so funny. I did that same piece at Green Space. I did. I did. And I remember an audience member saying, you know, I love the piece, but I did not like you flipping off the audience. You, you talk a little bit about hate in the piece, but then you continue it by flipping us off. Oh, you know? okay. And I mean, I didn't have a response for that person at the time, but I appreciated that they felt something. They, they yeah. didn't like that moment enough to articulate to me why. And I think that is 
the beauty of what we do is not to have someone say, oh my God, I love your work. I love it. It was amazing. But for them to take something away from it, good or bad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because the haters will still help you get your bills paid. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, so yes. As long as they're talking about you and they're talking about your work, um, I think we've done our job. And that's something that I slowly had to learn, especially you know, going to a downtown school, but coming from what I consider uptown training, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I idolized the, the Ailey School and their teachings. Um, and I still very much respect them and the work that goes on over there. Uh, and the choreography that the Ailey Company does, you know, I thought about black dance and what is this? And, and then I got to this school and I was like, why y'all rolling on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? And so yes. that, that was definitely a process for me of understanding that one lateral T and contraction did not mean black dance. Right, right. And two, rolling on the floor or being a human in art did not mean downtown dance. And so I, I, I hope that my work is starting to make this kind of marriage between um, understanding and utilizing what we train with our technique and the beauty of it, but also maintaining to keep the human inside the human. I don't really like the word pedestrian, but I, I love human. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. So I can definitely, uh, yeah, <laughs> seeing those worlds of like, ah. Uh, yes. Yes. So I, I have a question. It's going to be oddly formed. So sorry. Uh, we were talking before we started recording about your, your work from last evening. And what I really enjoyed seeing was this space of all black men. And mm -hmm. is that how you normally work or is it just an all male company, but with this particular project, it was all black men? Uh, it's so Project 44 is an all male group, um, and it's not uh, all African American men all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have some projects that I think um, are worthy and needed of that display. Um, I think my work is very much a reflection of me uh, anytime it hits the stage and anybody that it presents. Um, but there's only s certain ways that I can share. There's only so much of myself I can share to an artist about the work. And so it has, they have to allow themselves to be put into the work as well. And so, you know, when you're tackling certain topics or certain understanding you need certain bodies that can speak to that you know i did um yeah. and, and it's hard to to ask someone to act especially if they're not on the road with you or if it's not very clear cut like a um like a play you know a mm -hmm. book is those those characterizations are very clear cut of who you are and what you say um but sometimes if you don't have that character backlog or, or understanding of who that character is, it's harder for the, the actor or dancer to, you know, imagine that. I did um, an all-male Snow White called Christopher once, called Christopher, uh, two years ago. And it was looking at the ideas of beauty in the LGBTQIA plus community, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the people in my original cast had a hard time of understanding where I was coming from because their experience was very different. Gotcha. And, and unlike Brothers and Sons, for that, I didn't ask for their input. I was like, this is who you are. This is, this is your contribution to this. And I found that I found that they found it very difficult, you know, because, um, we all have certain views about how society views view beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those 
aren't on the line. And, you know, due to budget restraints and rehearsal time, we weren't able to really talk and to develop it. But with Brothers and Sons, like before we even started moving, we talked. Yeah, yeah. We talked and we found a common ground that surpassed us just being black and being men. Mm -hmm. uh, our common ground became about experience. And that, and that was really important, I think, to the work. Yeah. Yeah, it was, as, as I mentioned, it was incredibly evocative of, well, just the, the scene with the watermelon. I like watermelon. I will never <laughs> eat it in public. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 a touchy it's a touchy um, fruit, <laughs> and you know just some of the imagery and kind of implied objectification of the the men mm -hmm. was yeah it, it reminded me a lot of conversations like I said that I'm having with my daughter now about race in this country and she's going to have a very different experience from me because she's biracial and is very light-skinned like when i am not with her people approach her and start speaking spanish or assume she's north african or puerto rican and then she's like no i'm black there's my mom <laughs> <laughs> yes you know what's funny i had a friend i went to high school with years later she was like oh you're not dominican i was like <laughs> No, because, <laughs> you know, my mom started to work at the high school where I went to school after I left. And so people didn't put the two last names together. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that's your mama? I was like, yeah. 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 What? Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about, because I don't. I honestly, and I, I struggle with this all the time because I'm trying to think over and over about black female dance makers. Oh gosh. You, did you see how you looked? You know, because we, we, we have some of them that are at, you know, at the top and doing yes. their thing. Yes. But when I think about, you know, trying to partner with, someone that is kind of on that same playing field with me, I wonder where they are. I, I, I definitely see more black men making work. And I just wonder, yeah. have you, have you, as, as, a, as a black woman that makes work or that has made work, do you, do you feel support? I do not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do not. And I will be, uh, Frank, some of that is my fault in that I am a reluctant choreographer and sort of getting getting into choreography, I think, late. You know, I am I am not 30, I am 43. Yeah. And now in this place where I am asked to produce something or think about producing something semi-regularly, I don't know who to talk to or introduce myself to in terms of getting funding or finding space other than um, shaking down my friends, which yeah. is fine. And that will get old. And that, you know, there's, there's, so there's that piece of it. I think the other piece of it is um, just pragmatic. I'm a single mom. So, you know, I, if I get, if I'm looking for help, I'm really looking for, you know, childcare <laughs> or, or I'm looking for other things like a, a dramaturge, like a relationship with a dramaturge mm -hmm. to make sure that what I'm saying is actually what I intend to say. But yeah, like I've, I've applied to a, a couple of things, but I've applied to them knowing that my name isn't big enough. I'm not stand out enough. Um, basically, I am not enough to have someone go, oh, yes, let's invest in this one. And, and I know that there are Black women who are 
more established than I am. And they are, they're doing the best they can to help me, <laughs> help me get somewhere. And, and they, they can only do so much because they are also trying to make sure that they get their next grant or, yeah. ha, you know, their next performance venue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I've done, I've literally, I've done some festivals around the United States. I'm like the king of Google and applications when I remember. <laughs> but I just, you know, and I see male choreographers and I'll see white female choreographers. Um, I don't see a whole lot of black and Latino women, you know, at, at these at these beginning stages of making work and wanting, I don't know if they if they aren't applying. I mean, I've, I've been on the adjudication panel for some of them and I didn't even see a lot of applications come through, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. for one festival. And I don't know, it, ma it makes me, it makes me kind of sad mm -hmm. that I, I, you know, I don't, and I don't know the backstory of what everyone's going through, but, you know, I just like to say that, you know, like you said, your story whatever your story is that you're trying to tell, it's enough, you know? I remember, I don't know if you know, if you saw Dance Now last year. I did a lot of things last year. I there was an article written okay. by a gentleman that was published by the Dance Enthusiast. Okay. Go on. And he and he basically reviewed the entire show except for two people, and they were two women of color. No. He did. And um, I wish I would have thought to build the article. And what he said, and what he said his reasoning for that in the article was that what I took from it was just basically telling your story is not enough. And I was, and, and you know, and and the the claws came out as they should. Yeah. Against the dance, you know, dance enthusiasts and so many things. But I don't think. I think a lot of people who were okay with the article weren't understanding that a person, let you know, a critic or a reviewer, or whatever they call themselves, saying to these two individuals that just who you are is not enough was like crazy you know yeah and especially when you had other people on the bill that there was a um a, a male duet by another male who i believe he's gay so that's kind of like his story mm -hmm. there was a woman who um is um who performed in a wheelchair that was her story. Yeah. Do you know? So you have all these other people that are selling, that are really telling stories. I think even even for the most downtown of dance white person, that still is their story of what they're sharing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Of mm -hmm. who they are. Um, and just to say that to someone yeah, that's, whew, that's, that right there is like all my hesitancy for even wanting to choreograph. Yeah. And yeah, and, and to share, just to share me on stage is to know that there's someone in the audience who's like, eh. Right, and it's like, eh. and, and, and you know, it's like, I mean, there are people who do the, the who do African diaspora beautifully. Do you know what I mean? Who really, really um, shows some provocative and amazing work, um, yes. and I don't think that's me. It's not me either. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I feel like, do I not meet a quota for anyone? Yeah, I'm. I, especially early in my career, I was often the only black person or person of color in in many regards and it was always weird when there was another person of color who showed up in rehearsals because i thought oh am i about to get cut <laughs> now, now you've you've got two <laughs> how's this gonna work 
<laughs> and in some cases, yes, it did mean I was going to get cut. And in other cases, it did, it did not. But yeah, like I, I've been, I've actually been thinking a lot about my, my movement practice because I am like, I had the very stereotypical United States training. It was ballet until college. And then even my first year of college, I just did ballet because that was what was familiar to me. And then I finally get into modern. And I was like, I have to get on the floor. Ew. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then, and jazz was, was fine, but yeah, just, gravitating towards modern dance basically because that was the one concentration in my in my degree program at East Carolina University that did that didn't say I had to lose weight <laughs> so I was like okay yeah I'll stick with modern because they're fine with my body the way it is and and um now you know like 20 years later 30 years later whoo um taking ballet class because it's the most convenient to take in an apartment during a pandemic. I'm starting to sort of, you know, butt up against uh, a lot of ideas about where I should be technically as a dancer who trained primarily in ballet for so long, but hasn't like this is the most consistent ballet practice I've had <laughs> since 1997. You know, so it's, it's not it's not like I've I've been in and out of a ballet. No, I've been rolling on the floor right, from that 19, yeah. 1997 on. I've been on the floor or picking people up. That was the other thing is I was always uh, I was always seen as as the big dancer, so I was always the lifter. So mm. to to go back into this form where there's there's a very clear aesthetic that my body visibly does not meet. It's, yeah, it has me wondering like, oh, this, should, should I, should I try, should I like try to make it before I'm like really too old to make it <laughs> or, <laughs> or just, or just should I, should I like interrogate this experience as a scholar or should I, you know, be more mad scientist about it? Or should I just, you know, I'm moving my body, just let it go with I'm moving my body. Right. <laughs> just we're just moving today and that's yes. we're gonna move and, and go. Yeah. Yes. Um. So that my only steps were not to Dunkin' Donuts to get to get my child <laughs> a glazed donut, but you know, that I did something else worthwhile yeah. with my day. <laughs> yeah, but I I yes, I have run across that that sense of i i don't do african diasporic work as a movement practice i'm not that super super classically trained person i'm in this weird middle place mm -hmm. that is simultaneously marketable and not <laughs> like I, I can I can fit in in a lot of places but right. I don't stand out either yeah I mean I, I totally I totally get that and yeah it's it's a rough place to be I think um And I'm gonna say this, and I apologize if I offend anyone. Um, I think this place that we are in sometimes gets the least amount of support from other Black people. Mm -hmm. But that, and that's that's how I that's how I feel. I don't know. Um, I can see that. You know, yeah. I I've been good or bad under Project Forty Four, not under Project Forty Four. I. I've done a lot of work in the city um, and I feel like I, I invite a lot of people of color to my show, or at least I want, you know, I want them to come to my show. I remember reaching out when I first graduated um, to some of the people, granted I didn't really know them, um,
but um, <laughs> it was basically just like, hey, I'm, I'm a black man that's doing work in New York. You know, I would love to talk and like just talk about navigating in this space. Um, no response. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, no. But, and so that, that, that really led me, especially because I went to a school where there was only, you know, two black men in my class. It was just only two men in my class anyway. But, mm -hmm. you know, he was, he was kind of busy doing other things. And so I, you know, for two years, as I started to be more of an adult and understand my choreographic voice, I longed for this sort of brotherhood um, to just talk about experiences and dance. And so mm -hmm. one of the clips that I have today is from a trio called Gandhi Dancer that um, was my first experience back in, I think I did it in 2015, of really just having two other black men in the studio and this work stemmed from us talking. And so that the piece was about what stuff that binds black men together, love, music. And it was called Gandhi Dancer because in, in the South back in the day, the men who laid the railroad tracks used song and music to coordinate movement. Right. And so that was kind of the inspiration that we would see today. Um, cool. uh, what are you sharing? I'm sharing excerpts from two works. I'm actually sharing uh, It's All Good Hair, which is the piece that I presented at Tape Root in January. Uh, and I'm also presenting an excerpt from my thesis concert, kind of like the first uh, time that I got to choreograph something for me, about me, by me, um, called Wrestling with the Whip. And I'm a knitter in, in knitting. WIP stands for work in progress. And what I really appreciated about, well, both of those projects, but wrestling with the WIP especially is I, at this point, my, my marriage was kind of on the rocks. And so I was like the primary caretaker of my daughter. And I was bringing her basically going to school, picking her up from daycare, and then bringing her back to school for rehearsals. And I in, had invited all of the other dancers. The majority of the dancers were over 30 and were mothers. So um, I had invited all of the, the moms to bring their children to rehearsal if they needed to, because I was really interested in how not interrupting our, our lives as mothers and trying to like intertwine this art making and motherhood together would influence the work. And it, it did in a, a variety of, of ways. <laughs> Um, but the part that I'm sharing with Wrestling with the Whip is actually my mother talking about when she gave birth to me and a, a duet with another Black woman. And then with It's All Good Hair, I'm talking about when I learned that having natural hair was a bad thing. Mm. So let's start with maybe wrestling with the whip. Okay. okay. I'm excited to see. Thanks. Back, to, back in those days, you just, I mean, it was just starting to do all those sounds, but you know, it was, you didn't know what you were going to have mm -hmm. until you had it. Uh, so I was surprised when you were a girl. I was surprised when it was a girl. Uh, I wanted a girl. So what were your first thoughts when you should Um, my friend, um, Kathy, uh, Ellison was pregnant and then she had her 
a baby girl afterwards. And then mom fun time. Oh. Two girls and stuff. Run, baby. Almost there. Nice. I love it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it, it, it's wonderful to see Black women moving like that and not have to be in a, a major company. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? I mean not as, yeah. you know, but yeah, it was, it's the effortlessness of the movement and the power. I really, really liked it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have to give credit to the woman I was dancing with, Stacy Clater. We'd actually danced together for, I think, six or seven years at that point in, wow, in, yeah. in various companies in DC. So it's, yeah, we, we call each other the, the sister from another mister. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to share um, the excerpt from Gandhi Dancer, the, the piece I spoke about. Um, this is actually, um, there's a little intro, but this is the first section. That, we, that I mentioned to you.
Thank you for sharing. I love <laughs> the use of time, especially with uh, you know, the first section where it's almost like this braiding and unbraiding of the three dancers. Oh, and then the, the second piece of music, <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. I think we have time to see your second clip. Okay. That one is, yeah, it's all good hair towards the end of the work where, as I mentioned, I learn that having coily hair is, is not good. <laughs> And then while she's setting it up, I'll just kind of introduce the last clip that maybe we can just go into right away. Mm -hmm. um, it's the just the opening scene from uh, my new short film, Brothers and Sons. Um, just as a little teaser and to reference what uh, Nicole might have mentioned earlier. a awesome protective style, one for fun or one for the office, and the style lasts for about four to five days. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.
somewhere in upstate New York, curiosity became one of those strands in my deep strand. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back a little bit. Once upon a time, in, on a Saturday afternoon in 1986, in the kitchen, with my kitchen, my mother started me on a weekly regimen of paper bags and pencils. So, so no one's teaching someone how to be accountable. And that's what we need right now in our nation. So what you're going to see is like, even if inside of pain, it is the, the darkness that leads you to light. Now you know you're alive. At least you know you're alive, you know? And by forgiving you, I release the shackle that you have put onto me and the situation that we've had makes me upset about certain things. And that's basically what I'm, I'm trying to do. And my forgiveness, I'm trying to relinquish the idea that I'm so attached to you because of this one incident. Pain normally feels like a volcano. It's hot. My daddy said, never say I'm sorry to you, I'm sorry. I apologize. And then you said, I forgive you, right? That's all that happened. Like, she called me and was like, Trey, like, where you at? Like, what, what's going on with you? It's like, kind of duty. Every day, anytime I saw her, I was supposed to explain to her the five letters of respect. And the first one is the respect for self. And without that, you can't do anything else. Um, in the realness, like she saw me and she knew who I was and she understood that I was going through something and not to hold that against me because she saw me. You know, and when she told me that, I was like, oh, you got the and I think that's yeah. the idea that, like, we're all talking about how, how we see other people and how they respect us, but until I know that what I deem as respect for myself, my morals, then I can't even tell somebody else because then once in the past, I'm like, these are the things that I hold, I hold value to. These are the things that I are, are, are forgiving and that, that resolution. There's pain inside of them. That's why we sometimes don't let go. That's been my, my first since I got to see we've been through the trenches together. And he's like, are you crying? I was like, no, but I want to. <laughs> Yay, us. Yay, us, yeah. Yeah. It's lovely, you know, I think, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, from those two clips, I know we, they were specifically curated, but I just, I saw so much black dance and not a tilt or a contraction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I do not do, I haven't done tilt since college, undergrad, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> no one has asked me to do a single tilt. Oh. Contraction, yes, but not, not a tilt. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not saying those are bad, you know. No, um, no, just these hips they ain't giving giving it to you no more. I mean, I'm I'm ecstatic if I can give like a very nice Margot Fontaine ninety degree. <laughs> like, look at me, mm. I have made it. <laughs> My leg has made it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. It's been lovely talking to you. Yes, likewise. Yeah, I, I mean, I look forward to um, seeing more of your work. Or do you want to share any any handles where we can reach you or look you up? Oh, I'm on Facebook as I think Nicole McClam. I'm on Instagram as Nicole Yvette Seven Seven, and I know I have a website, but I'm never on it, so I'm not going to give. <laughs> I feel like website updates are like always need to happen. I've been needing yeah. to update my website, you know, years ago. Yeah. I should, I should. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can find me at Project Forty Four Dance on Instagram or Facebook. They're all connected, um, and see more of our work. Um, and just, I think you can search us on YouTube, right? Yes, I'm somewhere on. I think it. I think it's actually my name on YouTube. Or is it Project Forty Four on YouTube for you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they'll come up. You know, Google and all that stuff. You can find anybody. <laughs> yes. So I'll say I'll just, I'll definitely conclude with a thank you to Green Space for this opportunity. Thank you, Gier, for mm -hmm. the lovely conversation and the sharing of work. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing everybody in the new Yeah. Future. I echo that sentiment. Um, you know, in Queens, we definitely have a great community. We're building. Um, people sleep on the arts in Queens, but I, I, we're here to stay and uh, I'm, I'm proud and happy to share the space with you, Nicole. And again, I echo the thank you to Green Space, uh, to Valerie and Whitney for this opportunity. But until then, we'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Take care.